Hello, Stephen Crashett. Good morning, Steve Kaufman. We are on the same same time zone and in many ways on the same wavelength. Absolutely. Uh, I have to tell you, you've been a great influence on my language learning. It's a real privilege to be able to talk to you and to share now with other people who are going to follow this uh, interview uh, some of your thoughts on language learning. Oh, gosh. Oh, shucks. I have yeah. to return the compliment. <sighs> I've read your book. I've looked at. I'm a, I am now your student officially oh, on your website. I've been doing uh, Mandarin and Spanish, and I greatly admire what you've accomplished. Thank you very much. Now, the uh, uh, there's a cer certain amount of controversy still. Like for a believer in input like me, the, the battle is over. But there's still a lot of controversy. There are people who say uh input only won't do it you need grammar uh, how much grammar do you need uh, how much output do you need can you sort of and i'm sure you've been at the sort of the eye of the storm in so far to, so far as all of this controversy is concerned where do you see your five theses today to what extent has it with, withstood the test of time withstood the criticism and so forth well i'll begin by quoting paul simon Still crazy after all these years. Okay. I think the hypotheses have held up very, very well. Let me uh, give a little historical perspective. When all this started in 1975, when we first stated that there's something called language acquisition, the first goal was to show that acquisition is real. Mm -hmm. At the time, people fully believed in what I call the skill building hypothesis. That first you consciously learn something, then you practice it over and over again, you get feedback, and eventually it becomes automatic, which I call a delayed gratification hypothesis. Work hard, study, do your grammar, do your vocabulary, and someday you can actually use the language. You can understand it, you can speak it. Well, the, uh, my claim is that the gratification never comes, it doesn't work, and it's painful. And the comprehension hypothesis says that you can have a good time now, you can enjoy yourself, you can listen to interesting stories, go to movies, read good books, and the result of that is language ability, very different. So the first task was to show that this was real. And I should say that this is not my idea originally. Other people had it before I did. I have simply been responsible for public relations. Before I, by the way, do we have a lot of time for this? As much as you about. want. I have oh, time. good. I got some nice stories. Okay, All right. good, good, good. I hope. Um, uh, people knew about it before I did. In the field of foreign language teaching, James Asher, TPR, knew about it before I did. Uh, Leonard Newmark, professor from University of San Diego, knew about it before I did. Harris Winnitz, a scholar from Kansas, knew about it before I did and published about it. And I had read Asher's work when I was a graduate student, and I thought this was just amazing. Now, it turns out, this is going to get weirder and weirder, I went to my uncle's, my aunt and uncle's wedding anniversary, 50th anniversary, uh, Boris and Anne Newmark, and Leonard Newmark was there. Turns out we have the same aunt and uncle from different sides of the family. Okay. So Leonard Newmark, whose work I've very greatly been influenced by, who I admire, we're on the same wavelength, turns out to be more or less in the family. Here's another one. Uh, people in other fields have come up with the same hypothesis before I did. Frank Smith and Kenneth Goodman have hypothesized that we learn to read by comprehension. We learn to read by understanding what's on the text, what's in the text. And things like spelling, vocabulary, most complex rules of phonics are the result of reading. Well, Ken Goodman is married to a very interesting lady named Yetta Goodman who is a vigorous scholar and hero of the field. And we've always been good friends. And one time I was at their house in, in uh, Arizona, and I was staying with them. We're, we're that close. And Ken says to Yetta, Yetta, tell Steve the story of your family the way you usually relate it. And she did it Kunta Kinte style in Yiddish, right. which is her family language. So she started out in Yiddish saying, my name is Yetta Goodman, originally Shapiro. My family, I'm the granddaughter of blah, blah, blah. We come from this little village, shtetl, called Ledizhinker. And I said, wait a minute, Ledizhinker? That's where my father's family comes from. And, and where is Yiddish, that? In which country? 
in Eastern Europe, it keeps changing countries, right. okay? Belarus, that, Poland, whatever. Yeah. Exactly, in that whole area. So, and her Yiddish was highly comprehensible to me. Turns out, and Ladishinker is a tiny little town of 3,000. And my family in Chicago always went to Ladishinker picnics, and there's a Ladishinker area in the cemetery, and all this. So, Ieta and I have to be relatives, because it's such a tiny town. Right. And here we are, I'm always honored when I'm criticized in the same sentence as Ken and Yetta Goodman, and it turns out that we're related, sort of related to. Right. Now, Yetta's Yiddish is much better than mine. My Yiddish is really fake from German, okay. so she speaks a more purer form and always uh, scolds me for it, but, you know, so be it. So the theory, the idea of comprehensible in is not mine. It comes from other people. What I did is put it in the context of a larger uh, theoretical framework, mm -hmm. and I've been gathering evidence for it uh, since 1975. Uh, in the beginning, the idea was to show that this was real. Right. And then study after study, yes, it's real. People get better from just comprehensible input. Then the uh, research started to focus on grammar, which is your question. Uh, what about conscious grammar? Does that play a role? And I had hypothesized that grammar is not bad. It's not evil. It's right. not teach grammar, go to jail. It's just that it's very, very limited. Right. And its primary function is for editing. In order to use it as an editor, you know, you're about to say the sentence, you think about it in your mind, and you make little changes based mm -hmm. on your conscious knowledge rules. But conditions have to be met, and these are very daunting conditions. You have to know the rule, and we know only fragments of language, according to Chomsky. Right. You have to be thinking about correctness as you're using it, right. and you have to have time to apply the rule. And uh, what I'm happy to say is that in the last 15 years, there has been a parade of studies in the professional journals attempting to show that grammar is important. To my mind, they all show that the impact of grammar is there, but it's limited. Right. I think it can be useful. It's an adjunct, but it's not the whole thing. It's a very peripheral part of any language teaching program. Uh, the way it is helpful for most of us is when we write, because our versions of any language are always a little different than the accepted standard. Uh, when you consider English, my first language, your first language, there are little aspects of written English that we do, each of us has our own idiosyncrasies that differ from the standard. For example, my favorite example is it's, it's, one with the apostrophe, one without. Uh, according to my scientific studies, and that's basically asking people to raise their hands, my conclusion is that two-thirds of the well-read public has acquired the it's, it's rule. Another one-third, and that includes me, have not. Mm. Our standards in written English are very high. So you got to get it right. And I think it's important that I know the rule and I can make these corrections when I edit. Uh, it's limited, but it's helpful here and there. So grammar's not, it also gives right. you more confidence. It also gives but people like you, us. Yeah. I'll tell you how I, how I use grammar, all right? Good. What I find is that overwhelmingly I learn the language through input. I learn the language subconsciously, as you say, because the, the words, for example, that I consciously learn are a very small part of the tens of thousands of words that I've had to learn in Russian and Czech just recently, for example. So I acquire all of this uh, through my input activities. But with the grammar, I also acquire most of my familiarity with the structure of the language through input. However, uh, and, and I believe that the brain gets used to it through this massive input. Like, again, on, on Link, I have statistics showing that I've, yeah. I've read 150,000 words of Czech. So I've had, and I've listened to it all. So I've had massive input. However, some things I just don't notice. I just don't notice. You know, an example in Russian, uh, you know, one of something is, I think it's the, the genitive singular or something, two, three, four is, is another word, and five and more is another word. You may not notice that. And so I keep my little grammar book by the toilet, and when I'm sitting there, I come, sometimes I'll flip through the grammar book, and I always find something that makes me aware of something that I hadn't noticed before. So, so to me, the grammar, much like the output activities, it makes you aware of your gaps and improves your ability to notice and helps the brain notice as the brain is going through this, you know, the main activity, which is the listening and reading. So how do you deal? Is, is that an appropriate use of grammar? Does that in any way, I don't think it contradicts the input hypothesis, but it suggests that grammar in that way helps you notice things. 
Okay. First of all, I think the stuff that you say you haven't noticed is probably very late acquired. Mm -hmm. uh, things like in French, you know, uh, la chose que j'ai prise, that little, uh, the little ending on the past right. participle. Late acquired, probably leaving the language too in many cases, because a lot of native speakers don't do it. Uh, also, so it's other aspects like that. And when you see it in a grammar book, and it's simple, because you've acquired most of the language, you can probably monitor it fairly well. I find that when I speak German or when I speak French, languages I know the best, um, I monitor, but not very much. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few things here and there, so I can sound a little more educated. My favorite trick, you know, entre nosotros, is just nobody else should know. What you should do if you really want to impress people is you get the subjunctive wrong and then you self-correct. Okay. And then they think, ah, oh, yes, he's really, really. Yeah. So there are tricks like that. Um, so I think, yes, that helps. And some people can do it. But wait a minute. Look who you are. I accuse you, Steve Kaufman, of being a member of a lunatic fringe. And I am too. I am also in this group. We are fascinated by language, fascinated by grammar books, fascinated by the rules. We are really far out there, like 0 0.001 of the human race. I do what you do. I think my idea of a good time is looking at a grammar book I don't know, just to see how the language is put together. We call this language appreciation linguistics. So there are two requirements that have to be met. Number one, you have to have acquired near a lot of the language already. Number two, you have to be, as you and I are, very interested in the structure of language per se. Right. So with those constraints in mind, nothing wrong with it. I just confess to you, I do it too. But compare that with a beginning language student, Right. who hasn't acquired even 1% of the language and being forced to monitor the whole thing. Now, some language teachers like us went into the profession, people like us because they love rules and they teach them over and over again, it gets more and more obvious to them every time they do it. That, that's the problem, the overwhelming you know, hit of grammar I for agree. beginning students. And I think that grammar as linguistics is fine. I think there's a general education value to it. If I were, I think, high school, secondary school language arts and secondary school advanced foreign language should cover some linguistics, small part of it. Chomsky's incredible ideas of language universals being innate and universal and the idea of language change and dialects and how is language acquired, but it's not the main thing. It's peripheral. Okay. Well, again, on the subject of, of questions, uh, another aspect of, of your hypotheses is the idea that we should always be dealing with, first of all, compelling and interesting content, I fully agree. And, and that's where the enjoyment comes in. If it's interesting and compelling content, I'm turned on, uh, my brain is turned on emotionally, I'm, I'm committed to the language, I want to understand the content, that's all great. However, what almost contradicts that is the suggestion of this N plus one, a sheltered reading, guided readers, graded readers, I can't deal with that. I, I, I find that I got two or three months of slogging through the, that kind of simple stuff to get myself to a perch where I now attack the real stuff with 40% unknown words. Mind you, I have Link to help me because I can look up the words as I go and I can save them. Mm -hmm. But I have to get myself into that meaningful, authentic you know, content with resonance as soon as I can or my interest declines. So how does that... Uh, you know, uh, conform to the idea of N plus one, always that next level of difficulty. I think Paul Nation talks about 95%, 95% yeah. uh, uh, known words. Well, if it were 95% known words, I'd be years acquiring the vocabulary that I need in order to read Tolstoy or, or, or listen to, uh, you know, political discussions on the television and so forth. You have just described the problem of language teaching with capital P, L, and T. This is the problem. Uh, let me restate the problem. What our research concludes, that I think is the best hypothesis, is that for language acquisition to happen, input has to be comprehensible and very interesting, even compelling. I have done the easy part, me and my colleagues, we've done the easy part. We've shown that this is true. <clears throat> Application is the hard part for just the reason you talk about. I'm going to restate your question. It's very easy to give people input that's comprehensible, but not very interesting. 
That's school. It's very easy to find input that is interesting but not comprehensible. That's real world language outside the classroom. And of course, I must add that many of my colleagues at the university dedicated their entire careers to giving us input that is neither interesting nor comprehensible. The problem of language teaching is what you have described. I think we are approaching it gradually, uh, possibly asymptotically. The goal is for beginning classes to be riveting and beginning reading to be riveting. And we're getting closer. This is why I like methods such as TPRS, uh, Blaine Ray's idea. Wow, you go to some of these classes and they're amazing. I went to a demo across the street at Pepperdine University, which I helped set up, given by a guy who I think is one of the best teachers of all time, Jason Fritz, F-R-I-T-Z-E, free commercial for Jason. He gave us a beginning lesson in Arabic which had all of us at the edge of our seats because he made it so much fun and so interesting with incredible personalization. It was about the people in the class, about them, their opinions. Gradually we're doing this and the graded readers are getting better. We have not solved the problem. We're getting better and better and better. I'm trying to find interesting, easy input in Mandarin. And as you know, uh, I've, uh, I'm creating it myself mostly because I can't find very much other than that. Uh, Terry Walsh has written a couple of really interesting books that are both with full characters and pinyin in, in Mandarin, which are helping. But we, and uh, uh, Blaine and his colleagues, and uh, I'm trying to mention as many people's names as I can here, uh, and Karen Rowan and uh, Carol Gobb have produced a lot of good easy books in, in Spanish, but we need a lot, a lot more, and they need to get better and better. This is the problem we all have, so all I can do is restate it and say that I've done the easy part, me and my colleagues have. The hard part is interesting and comprehensible. Well, you know, I, I must say that, that I find that in my own la language learning, because I don't have the time to go to school, uh, and I've, I've heard all about TPRS, but I've never been in a TPRS classroom. I study on my own, so if I look at my yeah, experience too. with, with uh, Czech and Russian, where there's an abundance of phenomenal material on the Internet, history, politics, things that interest me, that with Link, I'm able to pull these in relatively early and fight my way through 40% unknown words. It doesn't matter because I have the audio. I'm saving the words. Uh, the words are highlighted in yellow when I come across them again because I forget that I've ever looked them up. And so that, for me, as a perhaps maybe not a typical language learner, that works. I'm not sure it works as well for the average person who doesn't have the confidence in their own language learning ability that I do. And so that's, again, yeah. uh, so that's a, a bit of a problem that we're trying to deal with at Link. A lot of our members have created wonderful uh, sort of a diary of taking my kids to the zoo and stuff, which if you're learning Portuguese and you, you, know, you follow some lady in, in Belo Horizonte in Brazil and her life, that's interesting and, and, it's, and, and it's made easy. So between, uh, you know, going straight to the literature, there are these sort of intermediate level, high beginner level um, things that our members are spontaneously creating and where we have the audio and we have the text and sometimes we have notes. So that is providing a bit of a step, uh, you know, in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I think your website is a real step forward in providing this. I also think that people vary in their tolerance for noise. Right. Some people require, uh, my colleague Steve Sternfeld calls these battered language students, some people require completely transparent input. Right. And that is where they have at least the illusion that they're understanding everything. Mm. And the TPR classes try to do that, which I think right. is okay, but it has its limits. You can't right. be transparent forever. I'm kind of between that level and you. Yeah. I'm now in Spanish is pretty well down on my list of competencies in language. I'm kind of low intermediate. I can have an easy conversation on everyday topics, but mm. nothing complicated. Mm. I'm now reading Star Trek in Spanish. Right. Because I love Star Trek. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. And I can now say things like, you know, a Klingon man of war has just dematerialized outside the starboard bow in several languages, which might help. You never know. Uh, but I'm, I understand about 60, 70, sometimes 80 percent. If it right. were less than that, I couldn't do it. Okay. I don't have the degree, but the right. trick is it's compelling for me. I love right. the stories. Well, well, that's what I find. If it's compelling, I'll fight my way through it. But right. I, I recognize, as you say, I call it sort of incertitude like I'm quite happy to deal with things that are fuzzy I don't have to know exactly what this means 
uh, you know, I have a I have a completely mistaken understanding of, of what's in this sense. It doesn't matter to me, you know, and that's why, for example, I always resented in language class, you know, these comprehension tests. Never mind the comprehension. I got my half baked, you know, understanding of what was there. I'll revisit it exactly. in three months and I'll understand it better. Not a problem. But I agree with you that maybe a lot of people, maybe most people uh, are troubled with that. They want to nail things down. And, and I just find in language learning, you can't nail things down until no, much, I hope, much later. I hope, I hope people like that eventually get over it. There's a great quote from John Holt. He, in one of his uh, classes, I think he was teaching fifth grade, a little girl came in, a little student, and she was reading Moby Dick. And he said, isn't that a little hard for you? She said, no, I just skip the parts I don't understand, yeah. which we're willing to do, yes. which is great, right. you know, the long descriptions. So part of the strategies people need to get is that you don't have to know every word. You can right. skip, etc. And people are going to vary. I hope with more experience in language, this requirement of transparency gradually disappears. Right. Which reminds me, it's a slight diversion here, but one of the, thing that has, one of the things that has interested me in, in the development of LINK is whether this would have application for literacy learning. Because every, all the reading that I have done suggests that a vast majority of people who are incarcerated, who are not call it successful in life, you know, whether economically or socially, low self-esteem, the whole works, are people who read poorly. And so obviously there's a percentage of people who can't decipher the letters, but there's a much larger section of people who simply read poorly. And I, I think where you provide people with audio, where you provide them with a system for accumulating words and tracking statistically that in fact the vocabulary is increasing as we do at Link. Wouldn't this have application for people who are not very, sufficiently literate in their own language to be successful in the terms that we normally consider people successful? Now, we're talking about people who are not good enough to be independent readers. Is right. that the idea? People who okay. are in the lower 50 percentile. And there's a lot of these well, people who have trouble. Probably the lower 10 percentile okay, in you know, that case. I'm, at least the literacy advocates talk about you know 20 or 30 or 40 percent of the people who are, quote, functionally illiterate, who have trouble reading manuals at work, who have trouble, uh, you know, communicating effectively, reading more, you know, beyond the grade seven level and so forth and so on. Well, if you're up to the grade three or four level, uh, you're pretty good. Okay. Uh, Archie Comics and uh, a lot of others are at the second grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, Goosebumps starts at the third grade level. Uh, some easy, easy novels, Judy Bloom, all this stuff, which is great reading, starts about the fifth, sixth grade level. Um, in fact, uh, adolescent and young people's literature today is better than adult literature. And we have comic books and magazines. Bestsellers are at the seventh grade level. Okay. So much of, I'm avoiding your question for the right. moment, well, no, no, but that's something else. Much of the uh, problem people have in prison is a lack of access to interesting books. Mm -hmm. And I have single-handedly decided to solve the problem myself. And I'll tell you about the heroic action that I've been taking. I joined a group called bookmooch.com. That's how I'm getting book in, books in other languages cheaply. You put all the books on your shelf that you have that you want to get rid of. And, you know, people like us, we don't want to just give books away to charities. We want to give them to people who want those books. Right. So I list my book, my book on bookmooch like I have an extra copy of a biography of Gandhi. Someone from New Jersey wants it, requests it, I send it to them, I pay the postage, I get a point, I can then use the point to request other books. So I use this to get books in other languages from mm -hmm. other countries. Mm -hmm. Bookmooch is one of the only groups that does other countries. That's bookmooch.com? Yeah, I love it. Okay, I'll At the end of up. the year, here's where I've been single-handedly solving the literacy crisis. Uh, at the end of the year, I have extra points. I may have 50 points extra at the end of the year. You can donate the points to libraries, and I always donate my points to prison libraries and school libraries at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So if every middle class person did this in the world, school libraries and prison libraries would be very well stocked. Okay. That, that's, that's my scheme. Well, people in prison, a lot of them just need a lot of interesting stuff to read. Uh, but the basic lower, lower, lower levels, nearly every method works. Some work faster than others. Everybody who goes to school in North America reaches that basic second, third, fourth grade level. The way to get beyond that is through three voluntary massive reading. This is in first language. Right. In second language, where you don't have a chance to hear it, uh, the link website might be very good. I don't know. That would be a good study to do. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Yeah, no, I, that's one thing I'd be quite interested. I've, I've approached various organizations, and of course, they all hold up their nose. Oh, you're for profit. You're this, that. And I've never had anyone willing to pay any attention to what we're doing. But that's a, that's oh a whole lot of stuff. That, that's outrageous because the yeah. profit people are running education in the United States and are very open about it. The whole Common Core Standards is nothing but a big economic ripoff for the 0.01%, and you can quote me on that. Anyway, it, I, yes, maybe afterwards, I, could, I would like to follow up, because I think, what, obviously, in our society, the better we read, the better people do economically, individually, their lives are better, the whole society does better. It's, it's just goes something. the other way around. It goes Fine. the other way around. The oh. wealthy classes, the people who are middle class, have access to books. Right. Therefore, they all read better, and their kids no, read no, better. Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. Anyway, okay. let's get back to the sort of foreign language acquisition. Um, I've seen some very motivated people, like I attended this American conference for t of teachers of foreign languages, whatever. Uh, I met a lady there whose name I can't remember at the University of San Diego, and, she's, and a number of the teachers were very motivated. I must say, I was overall, overall very, very impressed. And yet, the results of language teaching in our schools, if I look at French instruction in Canada to the English-speaking school system, and I've heard it's the same with regard to Spanish, which is the big foreign language in the United States, that despite all of these very motivated, dedicated, many of them very fluent in the language they're teaching, even though they're not necessarily um, native speakers, yet, yet the results are so poor. And there's been umpteen you know, examples of research. I mean, we've, if you compare like 30 years ago, 50 years ago, things have been researched to death. And I'm not sure that there's been any progress at all. Uh, so, you know, when will the results of all of this research be reflected in better results in terms of language instruction in our school system? Okay. Uh, let me begin by restating what you said and give more evidence that you're right. Um, the state of affairs in foreign language is really pathological because we know that the kids who do well, say, in college classes, are the ones who had it in high school already, mm -hmm. who are called false beginners. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who dominate the class and go on and do that. The true beginners get nowhere. Mm -hmm. And when we go to intermediate classes like literature, it's filled with native speakers or students who have been to the country for several years, who've been to Europe or spent some time in Quebec and then take intermediate French literature, etc. So the whole thing is, uh, is a charade, in my opinion. It always has been. Uh, and again, what you suggest, which is all, I'll spell out because it makes me look good, is that comprehensible input-based methods have been shown again and again, no exceptions. We have won every single method comparison study since the 1960s. Every time you pit comprehensible input against traditional language teaching, we win. On tests of communication, our kids are much better. On tests of grammar, there's either no difference or our kids are a little better. And our kids are far more likely to continue. It's true of beginning methods. It's true of intermediate methods, content-based sheltered. We know that reading is very powerful. One of my favorite studies I was part of, we looked at subjunctive among Spanish speakers, kids who've studied Spanish. And the only predictor that counted, it wasn't how much you studied it. It wasn't how long you lived in the country. It was reading, reading for pleasure. Mm -hmm. So we know over and over again. Why haven't people done this? Uh, good question. I wish I knew. This is my failure to master the art of public relations and get this around. One uh, source of opposition is natural and acceptable, and that is the loyal opposition. Whenever something new comes out, it is the scientist's obligation to question it and, give stu and do studies, etc. My problem is that those who attacked it have not thoroughly understood the theory or even superficially understood the theory, so there. So when they see a tiny little uh, speck that says that grammar might help here and there, they then assume that grammar is wonderful and that's all we should ever do. Uh, there's also, frankly, an economic force. If this is right, the textbooks are out of business, most of them. Right. And we have to drastically retool. Uh, another way out is to take the uh, step that you've taken, that I do, and that is focus on independent language acquisition, what can people do on their own, and websites such as yours and other people who work with independent students, this is a wonderful way around it. I'm all for it. My um, colleagues, Jeff McQuillan and Lucy Say, have a very nice ESLpod.com, right. yep. and oh boy, they've done more good than I have, because they just uh, give people, people who've had a little English in school worldwide, 
comprehensible text, comprehensible things now to listen to. I hope mm -hmm. they're adding that. Mm -hmm. And this is helping a lot of people everywhere. And they've like, I'm sure they have about 50,000 subscribers. It's mm -hmm. great. It's terrific. It's what needs to be done. Uh, a point you made when you read an art, when you posted a comment about Rosetta Stone, I thought was very important. And what you've made again here, and that is we have to set up uh, opportunities for independent acquisition. Just like you, I don't have time. Most people don't have time. I do my listening when I'm on the elliptical machine right. at See, Gold's yeah. Gym, yeah. which is now my my affiliation, not USC. Yeah. Uh, and when you know when I go for walks, etc., <coughs> in the car, and reading when I have time through the day. You know when I'm in security lines and airports. Right. Uh, Pilot says, put your tray tables down when I'm waiting for elevators uh, in bed at night. So we need to service these people, provide them with interesting text to listen to, interesting things to listen to. And I think this might change the field more rapidly than uh, anything. So keep up the good work. All right, well, I will. You know, Stephen, I, I have the impression we could go on for a long, long time. Uh, what I would like to do is, is end the sort of official part of the interview and thank you very much for doing this. And I'm sure that my uh, viewers at my YouTube channel will really, really appreciate this. And then I could maybe have a few words with you uh, after the I, I shut down the video. So I'll it's a deal. Fun. Thank okay. you, Steve. Okay. Thank you very, very much.